Welcome to a new episode of The Film Show, and up this week we've got two fabulous films for you. First up, a film called The Rocks, and then the closing night gala premiere of The Irishman, starring Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, directed by Martin Scorsese. And a lady I know you're going to love to meet for the first time, Muslim female film director who's going to take your hearts away. So don't go anywhere, stay with us here at The Film Show. Next up, a film brought to you by Sarah Gavron, the director of a film called Rocks. It shows and tells the story of a vibrant, engaging portrait of female friendships and growing up in London. Now, the entire cast has never featured in any films before. They're young and they're very, very upcoming and arguably stars of the future. The film is called Rocks. Just let it lift your soul and lift your heart. You enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I felt really happy that Sarah, Teresa and Claire were, were trusted me with such an important part and I felt like, I just felt so happy that someone could trust me that much, yeah. And I, I just feel really grateful that I got yeah. to have a best friend out of this as yeah. well and yeah. it was amazing to play her psychic. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was a bit, um, it was a bit uncomfortable um, at the start, but at the end we we worked it out. I I enjoyed it. When I got to see the film, when I got to see the film, um, it 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 was just like it was just like the new me. I keep saying it, but the people I met, like the, these people, I can never ever forget them. These these lot have been so nice to us and so accepting, so free, so open-minded, and I can never forget them. Yeah. Yeah, we just made a family now. Yeah. It's like. Now we, yeah, now yeah, we've made a family, yeah. 100%. Like some of the emotional scenes, I always say to people, it felt like I was naked on screen because I don't really show that emotional side all the time. And having to do that on demand more than seven times is, is hard, but yeah, it's worth it in the end. Yeah, you have to be vulnerable, I feel like. Let go of your pride when it comes to the emotional scenes, yeah. definitely, yeah. Look at this main. Have you ever seen this on the screen before? I've never seen it on the screen before, and the fact this is happening here in London at this time is legendary. What? Legendary. Legendary. Well, Teresa Okoko and Claire Wilson, who are the co-writers, came up with a storyline. Um, Teresa had a narrative she'd been working on for a while, and she brought that to the team. And we'd been workshopping these girls and creating characters in the world. And then she brought this storyline, and we started to inject it into the framework of the workshops, and then kind of build it with the children. And it was something about working with the young people and then being part of that process that was so invigorating. Yeah, well, we were really fortunate that um, Sarah has had the backing of Film 4 on all her feature films and their long-standing partners and the British Film Institute. They came on really early on when um, we had really a creative spirit and premise and we wanted to do things differently and we were for so fortunate that they joined us to support us and they helped us find this amazing first-time cast. I think it, it really, we had a very democratic casting brief and I think that's why we've got such a brilliant cast of diverse um, teenage girls because there wasn't something, we weren't particularly looking for a Somalian um, girl, British Somalian girl, or we weren't looking for a British Bangladeshi girl. Um, we just had this brief with girls that were up for it, for up for being storytellers, for up for contributing creatively and um, improvising and Really, they chose themselves because they were the best and most committed. To create an environment for the girls on the screen where they could look behind the camera and see women directors, women producers, women writers, and women camera people, and they could think one day I could do that. If, you know, and so th there was a connection between the behind the scenes and the in front of the scenes. <laughs> Welcome to the future. 
The music's everything for the girls. It was all London-based artists. You know, we've got fantastic Ray Black wrote a song for the end credits, which we're delighted about. And we had lots. We had grime. We had Afro beats. We had dancehall. We had Coco Roco jazz. We got lots of lots of influences, which the girls liked. Next here on the film show, we have an interview with Rubaiyat Hossein, an internationally acclaimed director from Bangladesh. With two films already under her belt, those being Mahajan from 2011 and Under Construction in 2015, she tells us about her new film made in Bangladesh, which is a movie about a woman's support for her husband by becoming a seamstress. However, she's horrified to see the conditions that not only they are being asked to work in, but the things they're being asked to do. This film is all about female empowerment and the rise of the first female unions in Bangladesh. In my film career, I have played different roles. I have worked as a production designer. I have uh, written scripts. I have produced. I have directed. And I've also acted. Um, and I think uh, I would like to describe myself as a director, really, because uh, for me, it's about the entire vision. And I write because uh, it's very hard for me to work with other people's story. I just have stories to tell. And then I do the production design because I want to like control all the colors and what's going to be on the palette. So it's it's a bit about trying to do everything. Um, but I think I I really enjoy directing as a whole. Mehajan was my first film and it was very well received in Bangladesh. But then a certain Part of the society objected to the film because uh, there was a plot line of a Bengali woman falling in love with a Pakistani soldier. So it was taken as unpatriotic, even though that was really not the case and I defended my position. So I went ahead and I wanted to make another film and I made Under Construction, which is about a middle class Muslim theater actor living in Dhaka. And it was well received in Bangladesh. I had two national awards and um, it was the opening film for Dhaka International Festival. Uh, and I also got very good reviews in Bangladesh. So it was well received internationally in Bangladesh both. And uh, then for my third feature film, I wanted to reach more of a global market and audience. So I made it as a co-production. So Made in Bangladesh is a co-production between Denmark, Bangladesh, Portugal and France. I think because Made in Bangladesh focuses on the positive side of the story, it's not about a woman being beaten or uh, forced marriages and things like that that you hear about a lot, but it's about a woman fighting and making a positive change uh, and defending herself. So I think that in Made in Bangladesh, you see a young Muslim woman as a, as a positive agent of change and not as a victim. Even though, you know, she's a Muslim woman, she's praying and she covers her head when she goes out. But she's also very vocal about her rights as a human being and as a woman. It's great. Uh, it's really great. Uh, it's a very big platform for us. Uh, there is a lot of Bangladeshi uh, living in the UK and they have come to the screening. So almost feels like home in a way. Well, I would just encourage them to watch Iranian films because, uh, you know, some of the best films in the last decades have come out of Iran. They're making really superior cinema. If you think about a film like Separation, which was so well received, uh, you look at a director like Abbas Kirastami or Asghar Farhadi or uh, I, I see films by Iranian women directors, so there's a great example of being able to create great cinema within uh, 
some Muslim restrictions of how one might dress, what you can show, what you cannot show. So, you know, I come from a Muslim family and my parents are quite conservative. And I never look at it as a restriction because I always look at Iranian films that there is a way to tell the story and also respect your faith. Now, all good things must come to an end, and the London Film Festival is no exception. Finally, we come to the closing night gala. This is the European premiere of a movie called The Irishman. You won't want to miss this. Directed by Martin Scorsese, produced and starring Robert De Niro. Out of retirement comes Joe Pesci of Goodfellas fame. We have Al Pacino and Harvey Keitel, to name a few. This film is as hard hitting as it gets. It took 10 years to come to the big screen and is the biggest budget for a drama movie. It's a great way to finish this 63rd London Film Festival. The biggest stars in the world are here and I hope you enjoy The Irishman. Is that Frank? Yes. Hiya, Frank. This is Jimmy Hoffa. I was reading the book because I, uh, originally to do research because I heard the character of Frank Sheeran in the book was uh, very interesting and he was a, a hitman. Once I read it, I said, look at this book, Marty. I think you're, you're going to... You're gonna want to do this. Me, Al, Joe Pesci, and Marty directing us. It's lucky, I'm lucky to, to have uh, been able to work with someone all these years and uh, and keep working together. I mean, I'm lucky. So it's a great thing when you're fortunate enough to be able to have that, that uh, dynamic and experience. It's great to open a festival and it's great to close it. So it's sort of, uh, you know, the same thing. It's exciting. You know, when we were working together doing it, it was, the, you know, we were together working on something. But now it feels like a dream team all of a sudden. It's just like, oh, how did this happen? So it's very special. Well, it's sort of an honorary spot to close the festival. And uh, certainly people like uh, uh, Scorsese and De Niro and Pacino deserve it. It's always fun. It's always a joy. We've been laughing since we met. I said they can expect to see something that's going to be meaningful to them. They will, re they will relate to and understand more about themselves, as all of his films do. I play one of Bob's daughters. She's kind of the one that really sees him for who he is and isn't really taken in by all the fancy trappings of the monster family. It's getting to be part of film history. Yes, I would. Whatever you need me to do, I'm available. Now it's time for an amazing press conference with the legendary film director, Martin Scorsese. And we ask him the all important question, how he put together a film like this on a budget of $140 million. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please now welcome to the stage, director Martin Scorsese. Followed by Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Why did it take so long? You've known each other decades. Um, and I know this project has been in your minds for a while, in one way or another. Um, so give us a little bit of context as, as to how The Irishman comes together. Well, uh, it, it goes back to um, uh, some uh, special work that uh, Bob and I were involved in for 20 some odd years. Uh, we were trying to get another project going. Um, based on um, tenure in Hollywood, so to speak, in the 70s and the 80s, and that developed into something else, developed into something else, and uh, we never quite settled on, on, the, on the project. From that point on, uh, we would always check with each other what we were doing, uh, whether I could fit into his plans and vice versa. We decided we had to do something. Now, but I think it was around 2010. No, 2008. Yeah. yeah. 2007. 2007, <laughs> thank you. And so... Uh, you were about to direct The Good Shepherd, 
and Eric Roth was writing that, and, and Eric, um, knowing that we were trying to do something called Frankie Machine about a hitman who'd retired, gave you a book called I Heard You Paint Houses by Charles Brandt for, for research. Yeah, I mean, he was, we were talking about it. He said he just read it, and, and he it, it just come out, and I said, oh, I got to read that book. So I did read it, it just as research uh, for the character, and then I, after I read it, I uh, got together with Marty, and I said, you, you got to look at this, and because uh, I think this is what you're going to want to do. So that was it. So Bob and Marty were ready to commit to uh, making Frankie uh, Winter Frankie Machine, and it was going to be financed by Paramount, Brad Gray, and we were all on a call together, and Brad was going to give us the green light, and in the middle of, um, middle of this conversation, Bob said, <clears throat> well, there's this other book that we're thinking about, and you know, it could be research. Maybe we could combine these two movies. And um, Brad said, oh, so you're thinking, so you want to take a Go movie and turn it into a development project? <laughs> and you kind of heard everybody go, mm-hmm. So anyway, that was uh, 2007. And then we brought Steve Zalian on. Uh, Steve and Marty and Bob worked together. And uh, we had optioned, I hear you paint houses. Frankie Machine went away, and uh, Steve delivered a script in 2009. Nine, yeah. Steve uh, wrote the, the script, which was terrific, wonderful, uh, as Marty says. And, and uh, then um, it was a matter of getting everybody's schedules mm. uh, to line up. Only three people in the world have one of these. And only one of them is Irish. When they, um, Bob came to me, called me about it, and it sounded really interesting, and the opportunity to work with them was, uh, you know, it was very important to me. I, I really wanted to, for years, we almost worked together, uh, Marty and I, in different things. And, of course, Bob and I have worked together. I mean, we've known each other I mean, since we were young actors. Um, so we, we and, and we worked together, so it was... It was a um, good thing. Yeah. We talked about it in a hotel in L.A. Oh, that's right, the hotel, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so coming back to me well, right now. I don't, well, it's so I long ago. Things. But the I thing was, he, after the discussion, we talked a little bit, and then he looked at us and he said, is this going to happen? <laughs> because the complications of schedules, and then, of course, no real enthusiasm, to say the least, about financing, um, really, um, it, it made it, you know, something that uh, is a nice dream, but we were pretty clear, as you said, um, Jane, that maybe the reading was going to be the, the, the only time you'd have heard it or seen it, you know. Um, but I think that reading was very well orchestrated, yes. I think. And Bob did it, they arranged it so that, uh, I guess you would say, the right kind of people were there to, yeah. to, to, to listen to it. And uh, that was a very affecting. Yeah, they got excited about that. The, 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 they still didn't give us the money. <laughs> oh, well, see, I didn't know but about that excited. part. You might be demonstrating the failure to show appreciation. In a sense, there was no room for us to make this picture. And uh, for many different reasons, I guess. And ultimately, there was a financial issue, too, in terms of the CGI that we did. And the reason why we went for CGI is kind of complicated, because at a certain point, if I made the film earlier, we may have could, they could have played younger. And then at a certain point, we missed that. And then they said, well, use younger actors to play them younger. And I said, well, that's, what's the point of that? And I don't know, back and <laughs> forth. And finally, the CGI, and we tried it. And so, oh, let's try. Let's see. Let's experiment. Open it up. I mean, CGI, and that, to that extent, is really an evolution of makeup. Really, you know, you accept certain norms and makeup. You know that that's, he's not that old if she's not that young, but uh, you accept that as a norm. I mean, you accept the illusion, so to speak. Taking that uh, and uh, having the backing of a company that says, you know, you will have no interference. You'll make this picture as you want. Um, uh, the trade-off is it streams with theatrical distribution prior to that. I figured that's 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 the chance we take on this particular project, you know, um, what streaming means and how that's going to define a new form of cinema. I'm not sure. I thought for a while maybe long form TV is cinema. It's not. It simply isn't. You know, 
It's, it's a different viewing experience. You could look at three episodes, two, four, ten, you know, one, one week, a second episode, the second week. That's not, it, it's a different kind of thing. So there's got to be still, what has to be protected is the singular experience of experiencing a picture, ideally with an audience. Well, I mean, this was a simple story. It was about yeah. a guy who was caught between two people who were powerful people and one of them was disappeared. We never knew what happened to him really to this day. Uh, the other one was also uh, the Joe Gallo referring to right. him. You, you still don't know who did that to him. <laughs> it had that to hang on in some ways, this, this political, this sort of, this grand story with these uh, historical, if you want, uh, uh, type characters. And a, a simple story. Yeah. Um, and also, Bob, in, ter in terms of that, when you're talking about these guys, and then on, on the other level, you have JFK, a Bobby Kennedy, a Martin Luther King, you've got yeah. uh, all this going on, and nobody knows really what happened there. Mm -hmm. And I always say, but would it make any difference now if we knew exactly who, when, how, and where? No. It's the dark forces that take over that are always present. And these guys are right in the middle of it in a way. They just walk by the TV and there's missiles coming from Cuba, you know. So, uh, and that's your afternoon lunch, you know. So, it, it, yeah, I mean, that, that, when you say the simple story, that was the thing to hold on to the simplicity of it because the rest is so complicated. Do you want to be a part of this fight? Would you like to be a part of this history? Yes, I would. Whatever you need me to do, I'm available. Well, there you have it. We've come to the end of another film show. It truly has been a fabulous experience meeting up with the stars on the red carpet for the films Rocks and Irishman. Also, of course, not forgetting the interview with Rubaiyat Hossein and her brave new film showing the rise of female empowerment in her film Made in Bangladesh. And finally, of course, with the curtain coming down on this year's London Film Festival, it's been a privilege to meet, talk and interview some of not only the biggest movie stars in the world, but some faces I know we're going to be seeing a lot more of in the future. If you want to know more about The Film Show, you can email us at thefilmshow at theislamchannel.tv. And until next time, enjoy the movies. Do you want to risk it all? I want to use what I'm good at. Would you like to be a part? of this history. Yes, I'm available.